Hello, everyone. Happy Thursday. Thank you for tuning in. My name is Audrey Stewart, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I am so excited to welcome you to tonight's event with Eric Larson discussing his latest book, The Splendid and the Vile, a saga of Churchill, family, and the defiance during the Blitz. He is joined tonight in conversation by none other than Nathaniel Philbrick. Through events like tonight's, Harvard Bookstore continues to bring authors and their work to our community and our new digital community during these challenging times. Every week we're hosting events here on Zoom and as always our event schedule appears on our website at harvard.com events where you can also sign up for our email newsletter and browse our shelves from home. This evening's discussion will conclude with some time for your questions. If you have a question at any time during the talk tonight, go to the Q&A button on your screen and we'll get through as many as time allows. If you would like to buy a copy of The Splendid and the Vile, there will be a link in the chat where you can purchase. All sales through this link support Harvard Bookstore, so thank you, especially during this difficult time for community spaces like your local bookstore. There will also be a link for donation in the chat if you would like to give additional support to Harvard Bookstore. Your purchases and financial contributions make this author series possible and now more than ever ensures the future of a local landmark independent bookstore. Thank you for tuning in in support of our authors and the incredible staff of booksellers at Harvard Bookstore. We sincerely appreciate your support now and always. And finally, as you may have experienced in virtual gatherings these last few months, technical issues may arise if they do, we'll do our best to resolve them as quickly as we can. So thank you in advance for your patience and your understanding. And now I am truly honored to introduce tonight's speakers. Eric Larson is the author of eight books, six of which became New York Times bestsellers. His titles include Dead Wake, The Last Crossing of the Lithuania, In the Garden of the Beasts, and my personal favorite, National Book Award finalist, The Devil in the White City. No matter what historical subject he writes about, Eric's readers can be assured that they are in for something amazing. His writing is detailed, impeccably researched, and endlessly fascinating. He is a master storyteller. And he is joined tonight in conversation by the equally eloquent and masterful Nathaniel Philbrick. Nat has written numerous award-winning books focusing on American history. His titles include Mayflower, In the Hurricane's Eye, Valiant Ambition, and my personal favorite, National Book Award winning, In the Heart of the Sea. When it comes to history, we really are in capable hands tonight. Tonight they are discussing The Splendid and the Vile. It is the story of Winston Churchill's first year as Prime Minister. On the horizon for him was the invasion of much of Europe by the Nazi Germany, the Dunkirk ev evacuation, and the horrors of the Blitzkrieg. Candace Millard from the New York Times Book Review said, Larson has transformed the well-known record of 12 turbulent months into a book that is fresh, fast, and deeply moving. And I'd like to leave you with a quote from NPR, which perfectly expresses how I felt when I heard that Eric was writing about Churchill. There are countless books about World War II but there's only one Eric Larson. Thank you both so much for being here tonight. The virtual stage is yours. Well, thank you, Audrey. Um, it, uh, it's great to, to meet you, Eric, virtually. Yes. It's, it's a real uh, honor and pleasure to spend, spend the next 45 minutes or so with you. And I have to say, you know, I, I, what, when I'm uh, reading recreationally, I uh, rarely read other history books because, you know, I just want to get out of that mode since that's what I do all day. But your books are, are books that I can uh, read for pleasure and to just watch you how you, how you make it work. And uh, I have to say, I was just finished your most recent uh, about an hour ago, and um, it's magnificent. It's written at a, you're, you're clearly at the top of your game. Uh, watching you work with material is, is is, is just fascinating and fun, and congratulations. Well, thank you very much. Thanks. Well, great. Well, listen, um, oh, I, I'm going to throw, throw in a footnote, though. And as I, as I you know, this is my first time uh, actually meeting Nat, and, and, and I'm delighted because he is sort of my, kind of my personal doppelganger in some ways. As I told him in an email earlier today, 
I had set out a while back to do uh, what I, I was about to commit to, to a book that I thought would be a, a killer book about Bunker Hill. You know, because I, I felt that nobody had really captured like the, 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 the true, you know, drama and gore of, of the event. And no sooner <laughs> I had this conversation with my agent than a certain author, guy who's at the other end of the Zoom conversation, comes out with a book about Bunker Hill. It's, <laughs> so I've often, I, 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 yeah, I, you sort of, I'm dogging your trail. I wish it were the other way around. Well, well. Eric, we do have certain similarities in, in what we're interested in. And it, yes. it seems to be, uh, you know, people, groups of people, individuals under enormous stress. Um, yes. You know, what's happening. And, and, um, and leadership has always been something I'm interested in. Um, is that what, what are the things that draw you to a topic? I'm sorry, the things what? What are the what are the thing what are the elements in a story that that attract you to a topic? Oh, you know, uh, uh, so it cuts the, to to the whole process of uh, of looking for looking for uh, the, the the next project, um, and you know, so many things have to have to work for me before I can uh, settle on the next project. And that's why that's why it takes me so long. I mean, this is why. You know, uh, my my friend and publicist Penny Simon uh, coined uh, uh, an expression for this period in my 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 career. I guess at each phase, when I'm looking for an idea, she says, "This is when I'm in the dark country of no ideas." Because yeah. because I'm I mean I don't know about you. I think I think you operate very differently than I yet. But when I finish a a a, a book, I've got a blank slate. Um, all the other ideas that I might have considered before of doing a particular book have suddenly sort of withered and died, and I'm stuck there out on this plateau all by myself. And that's that's this dark country of no ideas. And and when I when I'm looking for the next idea, a lot of things have to click into place, and that's why it typically takes me about a year before I start the next the next project. Mm -hmm. um, it, you know, it's got to be it, there has to be in the inherent in the event that I'm writing about. There has to be. Um, an organic, powerful um, narrative, a powerful narrative arc that, that in and of itself w would, if you tell the story properly, bring readers along. Mm -hmm. um, and then there has to be just this deep, rich reservoir of archival material because you can't, you know, I write what people like to refer to as narrative nonfiction. I, I, you know, and that, you know, that's what we do, right? That, that's right. what that's people it. say we do. I, I, I never like labels like narrative nonfiction. I mean, to me, I'm just writing history the way maybe it should be told. Um, but you know, you can't do it this way unless you have the stuff. Well, the juice is in the archives, isn't it? Yeah, juice is in the archives, and you have to have you have to have the, the minute details, um, or or you're just not going to be able to pull pull this off. So you got to have the deep, rich, rich archival base. But also, you know. <laughs> Not a small thing. You got to be interested in the story because you're going to live with this thing for four years. You know, Have I, you ever had a, a, a book where you you begin you know at the end of it you're you're going oh man I just need to get this over or is it is it inevitably um, you're just getting so into it as you approach the end that once I'm once I pull the, once I pull the trigger and dive into a book I'm I'm committed I love it I love it and, and it's because it's sort of a bifurcated process I love the writing. Um, but I also love the research. I love, I don't know about you, Nat, but I don't use any researchers. I love going into archives, plunging in, going to locales where these archives exist, and just wallowing in sort of detail and so forth. I really Eric, enjoy Eric if in, you know, the, let's say it takes you five years or whatever to write a book, what percentage of your time is research versus writing? You know, I, 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 in an ideal world, I would try to have everything done before I actually start writing. Um, that, that never happens. So it's a little hard to come up with a, with a right. percentage or a number. But typically, I think it, it's, it, typically it's about two years of intense full-time research. And, and I, I have the luxury, and I have to say, of being able to do that full-time, being able to dwell in whatever world I've chosen for two full years. Okay, and so when you say, how, what's your typical day? It starts oh, when... Oh, wait, wait, I'm leading up to something. I want, I want just, yeah. just let me, let me uh, sure. circle back to something. So, but at the end of that two-year period, what, and again, typically it's two-ish, two-ish years. 
what happens is the book starts to feel like it really wants to come out. Like, like this book really is, is begging me to, to, to begin. Um, it, it wants me to, to start writing this thing. So, so that's where the overlap happens. It, 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 the research continues and the writing begins at the same time. There's, there's an overlap of quite a while, maybe a year, maybe a year and a half. And actually the research never really ends until, until you get that, that second pass proof you know, and then, then you're done. No, I'm sorry. Go ahead. What was your, your thought? There? Yeah. So I'm just, when you're in that, that, that year and a half of research, um, two years of typical, research. typical day, do you, you know, are, do you wake up reading? Do you, I mean, you know, it's, it's, how do you structure that? Okay. So, so my typical day in the, in the, in, in the deep research process is, is, well, there's no typical day, really. The, 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 the way it starts is, you know, you do, you do the tertiary reading, you read the okay. secondary sources and so forth and, and read those until you can't stand it anymore, you know, but until you have a good grounding in what's, what's happening. And so, so on days like that, you know, I get up, I have my, bring a cup of coffee, my Oreo cookie into my office and I just sit there and read and I have my, all my little post-it things, that I, you know, and my highlighters and, you know, I, I typically, <laughs> what I've begun doing, actually, this is probably going to sacrilege to a lot of people, but what I've typically started to do now, instead of, it's, I, I'm finding it's actually more cost-effective for me to order books from, from a, a, a used bookseller like abebooks.com than to troop off to the library for, for, for a day and search for books in the stacks. Oh, that, that's what I do. Yeah. yeah and, and one big benefit, as you know, maybe you'll, you, I, I'm going to admit to this, maybe you will too, but I deface these books. I, I, highlight, I highlight these books, mark them, scroll through them, and it, it's very effective. But when the archive phase kicks in, then, then that's where the day has just become, not at all, typically. You know, obviously, I, I go to London, I go wherever the archives are. I love that. I love that. And, and you know, sometimes my wife comes with me, and that's especially nice in the evenings. You know, we have cocktails in the hotel bar and so forth. It's great. And the MO these days um, is, you know, once upon a time, <laughs> Once upon a time, in the dark old days, you had to, you had to photocopy everything uh, in archives. And the archives were always finicky about what you could photocopy, what you could touch. And it was a real pain in the ass. I'm allowed to say that because this is like a Zoom thing, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Not real. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, but now, now you, you, it's all digital photography, which is a huge boom. So, so my MO, I will go to, let's say, the archives of the National Archives of the UK. I'll spend a week there. And, and instead of sitting there, you know, for six months in this one week, I, I find documents, I read them just enough to, to know that, yeah, this could be valuable and I shoot it. So I, you know, I leave after, after that week, I come back to the United States. I've got a thousand photographs in my, in my phone or previously in my camera, print them all out. And then I process those over the next two months, you know, and then back to the archives. So there's no real typical day. The writing days become much more tough. Yeah, and and so you you sort of reach a point where you say, okay, now I'm ready to start the book. And um, well, I, I reached a point where, <laughs> where my wife my wife has a good analogy for this. My wife is a is a uh, is a, a neonatologist, intensive care for newborn babies, and and she 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 talks about um, you know um, babies birth a lot, and she also always reminds me of the fact that I will never understand what it's like to bear a child. So. All that aside, but she says she says there comes a time in every pregnancy where you realize this baby has to come out, and and that's how it is. You know, you start doing. I, I call it my page a day mode. I get up, and all I have to do that day, and I typically get up at four thirty or five o'clock when I'm when I'm in this this mode. I get up at at, at four thirty five o'clock, get my coffee, my oral cookie, sit down at my desk, and and all I have to do is do one page one page and I, I i always make it a point to stop at a place where i know absolutely where i'm going to go the next day oh yeah the hemingway rule yeah well i don't know if that's the hemingway it wasn't bad. <laughs> yeah. definitely my rule i mean I, I i thought it was the graham green rule but anyway yes uh you know i will i will stop in the middle of a a, a sentence um because as, as as you know i mean i mean this is, this is my feeling the toughest part part about writing is getting up to do it again the next day Mm -hmm. And if you know that you're going to sit down at your desk and just by finishing that sentence, you will instantly be productive. It really helps you get up in the morning. But something else happens that I think is, 
I, I, time and again, it's proven to me sort of magical, actually. And this is where I, I know I read this in Graham Greene's uh, uh, autobiography, Means of Escape, is that, is that if, you, if you leave something unfinished um, uh, in, in your writing and, and, you, and, you, and, you, and you sleep on it, even though you're not aware of it, your brain is working on that. Your brain is thinking about it. It's finishing that sentence. It's not just finishing that sentence. It's moving ahead, you know, who knows where. And so the next morning when you sit down, you're not just able to finish that sentence. You're able to finish that page. And, and frankly, in this page a day mode, it becomes more of a challenge to sort of hold off. You know, don't, don't get too much into this yet. You know, there's still so much more research. It's like, it's like keeping writing as sort of a treat until later when it ceases to be a treat. Yeah, yeah. Well, you, you talk about, I think it's in the uh, uh, acknowledgments or afterward of the book, about how you organize your materials for the in writing this book. Uh, you, you talk about the Vonnegut um, curve, is it? Curve. The Vonnegut yeah. curve. And, it's, and because, I mean, what you had so many elements in this book. You had, you know, Churchill's inner circle. You had, um, you had the German side. You also had the U.S. side. And, um, you, you you clearly knew from the beginning the arc of you know where you wanted to go it but talk a little bit about how the Vonnegut curve works how it helps you organize the material and and when you talk about the material are you we talking about typed notes are we talking about scribbled over uh, printouts of your photographs right. remind me about the second part of the question first the Vonnegut curve <laughs> which I yeah. love for, for many reasons um, Vonnegut curve is is and anybody who wants to can Google uh, Vonnegut curve um, and you will actually you will come across a video of Kurt Vonnegut himself explaining the Vonnegut curve, which is a, a wonderful thing. So the Vonnegut curve is basically um, it's it's uh, it's uh, it's it, it's a graph um, on on the, the the vertical axis at one end of, at one side of the page is um, is is bliss to misfortune, good good stuff to really bad stuff. And then the horizontal axis is, is simply chronology, which I feel is the single most important element of storytelling. And so it's really an interesting way of visually plotting where your narrative is going by where it fits on the bliss misfortune scale in terms of time. So, you, you know, you, you see this, 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 this arc and the, and the various parameters of this arc. And it, it turns out that there is a, that Kurt Vonnegut came up with a term for the very arc that that follows Churchill in this in this first year, a very dark year of his prime ministry, which is it's man in a hole. Man begins with a moment of great bliss. And for Churchill, the day that he became prime minister was the highest point of his life. He couldn't believe his luck, despite the fact that the world was going to hell. He was so happy. He couldn't believe it. he went to bed that night delighted, even though that very day Hitler had invaded the low countries, the world was totally going dark. Um, so, so he starts in this moment of absolute bliss for him, um, and then, boom, everything really does go to hell. And so he's got to bring everything back, you know, the threat of invasion, you know, London being bombed, you know, madness, chaos, death everywhere, and, and how he does it. So that's, that's the art. I have to say that one real benefit of the Vonnegut Curve is simply that it, <laughs> it makes you feel productive, even when you're not. If you're on a plane, you know, you got your notebook open. I always have an idea journal. Um, if you got your notebook open and you're plotting the Vonnegut curve, you feel like you're being productive. So anyway, what was the second part of your question? Yeah. And so when, okay, you've got the, how you're going to plot the th thing, the, the arc yeah. of it. And then what are you working from as you're writing? Mm. Uh, you're, you know, are your notes have you taken notes for a specific chapter? Do you have things scattered around your desk? Are they hanging from the wall? You know, what, how do you filter all that stuff you brought back from the archives? Yeah. Okay. Well, I, away? I'm typically hanging from the wall, but anyway, that's, that's another story altogether. I, I think that, you know, my, my, that has evolved actually for me. Um, earlier in my career, with my first book of narrative, nonfiction, Isaac Storm, I, there, I was doing a lot more note taking. Um, uh, again, that was sort of the photocopy era and, and so forth. Um, but as, as I've evolved, um, 
basically I, I have stacks of, of, of documents, these, these photographs, these thousands and thousands of photographs of documents, I print them out. Um, and these things are, are all over my office in, in, a, in a very um, uh, archaic, but to me, very sensible um, uh, order. So that I feel sometimes like I'm the Phantom of the Opera playing, a, playing the, the organ and all my, all my documents are the various nodes of this, this organ keyboard. And I can sort of see where everything is. And I find it very effective because I can just, well, I also, this is more than you wanted to know, but you know, each time. Each no, time, I think this is very, very interesting. Well, each time I don't I know if anybody else, else thinks so. Well, let's take, I know, let's take a typical document. You know, let's, let's, say, let's say it's a 40 page uh, report from the National Archives of the UK. Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll code it first. I'll call it, let's say, Nat, Nat Arc National Archives, you know, clever. Nat Arc slash one, Roman numeral one. That's the first stack of documents from the National Archives. I will read through this thing and I will highlight um, everything that is absolutely important in this document. Um, and then I will index that document. Everything that's important goes into an index. I call it a quote index. Everything goes into this index. Um, uh, which then I'd staple to the front of the document, but also now it's also a, a file on my, on my computer. I do that for all my documents. I'll have NatArc one, two, three, four, five, whatever, and then the next set of documents and so forth. But then the key, the key element of the, the whole thing, I feel, is that before I actually start to write, not necessarily before I go into that page of demo, but before I'm really rolling, um, I put everything, I go through all of these stacks of documents um, and all the important stuff that has a timestamp, that is to say that can be placed in some order in the chronology, some uh, associated with some date, or in the case, for example, my book about the Lusitania, even, even down to the minute, you know, what, so forth. And that all goes into this chronology, is, which is simply a computer file um, where um, everything from these notes um, coded to the to the to the identity of the document NatArc one and to the the subset of that NatArc one dash two, which is like you know the second page in that document where some great thing exists. And so so I have this chronology for Splendor of the Vial was 185 single spaced pages. And the beauty of it is, again, because chronology is the heart of the story, mm -hmm. um, it, it becomes, in effect, a, a sort of a de facto outline. And, and things tend to glom together at important points, you know, certain time, uh, time periods, time moments, um, uh, immediately become visible as really key moments in the story. And so, so it becomes this wonderfully powerful um, de, facto, de facto outline. And that's that's my key element. That's how I can, you know, I look at this chronology. There's just enough in that chronology of a particular quote that I will remember what it is and remember, yes, that's important. There will be the coded location and I can find it in a heartbeat. So right. that's, that's, that's the key. That's the key. Yeah. yeah. So that key, so you have some sense of where everything is. Yes. And, um, I, I have, I actually, in, in, the, in the end, I actually have a very precise sense of, of, of where things are. Having learned the hard way, um, with my, my, my first work of narrative non-history, you know, the Isaac Storm, um, that you got to know where everything is when it comes time for the footnotes. I foolishly, for that book, thought, eh, I'll remember where everything is. <laughs> yeah, no. Yeah, don't. No, I've, I've gotten to the point where I make myself uh, do work on the notes after each chapter, just so that I don't forget. And No kidding. No kidding. Yeah, it's, it's horrible. I lose a day, but... You know, like you were saying, you're you're already percolating for the next one, so it absolutely it actually kind of helps to hold yourself back a little bit before you then. Okay, interesting. Forward. But um, now I you do you I I read the first draft of every chapter to my wife Melissa, and um, and I find the act of reading helpful. You know, it just takes it out of the screen, out of the page, and you know, I just get a different sense of the material. Do you, how do you, what do you do when you finish it? When do you, you know, get feedback from others? At what stage in the process? 
I think your wife must love you more than mine does. I do. I do. No, I, I don't. Yeah. Well, I do read my books. Different conversation. I, I, I read. I read everything aloud, but I read aloud to myself because because I do think that that actually is 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 one of the most powerful things you can do as you're you know when you're fully into the the writing process because because you know I mean, my, my my rule is if 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 I read something aloud and I stumble, I, I fix that. You know, that's that, that's a problem. If, if there's something that stops me, you know, I, I, I have to fix it. I, I often know um, when I'm reading it's fairly, fairly far down the line. I often read, though, read to a soundtrack. I will I will pick out a sound. No, seriously, I pick out a soundtrack. But like like for the uh, for uh, for uh, uh, Lusitania, no surprise. It was the soundtrack to uh, Titanic, you know, because there are certain certain you know, emotional moments and scenes and so forth and 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 by by reading to music something interesting happens and i, I it, it's hard for me to really you know quantify what it is but i think it's very, very important yeah and well you have such a uh, love of words and phrases and and do you read much poetry no no i mean i do read poetry i i, I love i love um old poetry um Whitman, yeah. Whitman, Tennyson, um, Shakespeare. I've always found really intimidating, mainly because um, I was shamed once in like ninth grade English. <laughs> so, well, did, so when it comes to Shakespeare, when it comes to Shakespeare, I get the yips. Okay, yeah. Well, I think it's well. People have a similar thing about Melville and things like that. But do you? I mean, from when did you your interest in history, the thoughts that you'd be a writer? You know, when did you start feeling those itches and? And um, in life, I mean, does it go way back? Was it? Uh, well, you know, well, the, when I when I when I was in college, University of Pennsylvania, um, I arrived, you know, typical insouciant youth. I mean, the only reason I went to the University of Pennsylvania was because my girlfriend was going there. Um, I got lucky enough to get in at the same time. Two weeks later, we broke up. I mean, this is how life works for me, you know. So, so I was at Penn, and in my freshman, I had not really set out to, to, to study history. I didn't really know what I wanted to do. At, at intervals through those four years, I wanted to be a New York City cop. I wanted to be a, a, a lawyer. I wanted to be a history professor, smoke the pipe thing, you know, and tweet jacket, all that crap. And then I realized that was not necessarily for me. But in my first year at Penn, I, for better or worse, I took a course in Russian history with this professor, um, Professor Ryaznovsky. Um, who was a spellbinding lecturer and just made Russian history this magical thing. It didn't hurt that he was indeed, in fact, an exiled Russian prince. So, so I just fell in love with Russian history. I fell in love with Russian culture. That became my thing. Russian, this was my major, self-made major. Russian history, Russian culture, Russian language. And so just a full dive into, in, into this world. I can't really say that it was history per se that, 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 that drew me. It was like, I just, I just love this. And for that period, you know, it's like love the one you're with, you know, it made a lot of sense to do it. It was in fact the Vietnam era. Um, but so, so, so then, you know, one thing led to another, fate took a hand that I wound up, um, <laughs> this is too much to background, but the, I, 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 I got a job in publishing and then saw all the president's men and realized that's what I want to do. I want to become a reporter. Went to Columbia Journalism School. That's what I wanted to do. But it was only after I started writing books. I had two contemporary books that I published before I got into what I do now. Yeah. And, and it's not about history. It's about story. And yeah. And I think the training as a journalist is not a bad training for this kind of writing. Um, you know, I think it was really valuable, especially I, I worked at the Wall Street Journal. Um, I was lucky enough to jump to that from a small paper outside outside Philadelphia. And, and at the time, as incredible as this may seem, you know, um, a writer at the Wall Street Journal, I could spend I could spend a month on a four page double spaced article. We call these these were the A heads, the sort of funny stories that went down the front page of the, of the journal. Um, it, Nobody does that. You, 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 nobody has that luxury anymore. But, but what it did was it allowed me the, the luxury of 
of looking for those telling little details that would just make the story work. And, and the more you look, the deeper you look, the more fine grain your material, the more, the more lucky you, you, you're going to get. And that was really important. Mm -hmm. Right. And so you, it was with um, Isaac Storm then that you took the leap? Uh, it was Isaac Storm that I took the leap. I mean, the book before that was a book called Lethal Passage, which is a, a very, very contemporary work. I mean, I, 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 was, I, be, I was living in Baltimore at the time, and I became intrigued in, with, well, intrigued is not necessarily the right word, appalled by the fact that you know, at the time, the so-called drive-by shootings were a big thing in the cities of America. In Baltimore, especially, and I would read these these items in the in the, in the, in the Baltimore Sun, you know. And what the, the, the galvanizing moment was when I read about this 13-year-old who had this sophisticated handgun, a Cobra M11-9, and used that in a drive-by shooting. And my question right away was, well, where did this kid get it? And it was I realized it was never addressed at the time in any article about where these kids got these guns. So I set out to try to find out how that particular model of handgun, not just a specific gun, but that particular model of handgun um, migrated from being a, 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 a military weapon to being a consumer product given away free by the manufacturer on a monthly basis. And that became sort of my first quasi-narrative because I, you know, I was writing about actually a school shooting that took place in Virginia uh, back in 1980-something. Uh, um, and the only reason it did not become a really catastrophic shooting is because the gun, true to, true to its character, malfunctioned. So, so I followed all the forces that, that, that came together and put this gun in this kid's hands and, 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 and how all this played out in, in terms of that story. Quasi-narrative. Quasi -narrative. Somewhere along the way, I was looking into my next book, stumbled across this hurricane. Um, I was a hurricane junkie from way back. Maybe you are on Nantucket. I mean, how can you not know you're in Long Island? I grew up in Long Island in a glass house surrounded by tall trees. It's like total love. Yeah. Hate thing. Yeah. Meteorology is the reality story that matters here. Yeah. So. Yes. So, so, so I, I thought I knew everything there was to know about hurricanes. And I stumbled across this Galveston hurricane of 1900 that you know, first, when I came across the headline accidentally in the New York World, it said 2,000 dead, and I thought, ah, you know, it's yellow journalism. It turned out, of course, that the death toll from this thing was far, far, far higher. And I became sufficiently intrigued in that that I thought, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a book about this hurricane. And there began the real, real metamorphosis, because I also simultaneously had gotten a new agent, as one does. Early on, you know, all your writers out there, early on, you get your first agent. You're not going to live with that agent forever. At least I don't, I don't know. Do you still have your first agent? Um, yeah, pretty you, much. You too. <laughs> I came. I came into it relatively late in the, my forties. So anyway, yeah, I, I, I had my first agent, my second agent. I was now with my the guy I've been with forever, my third agent, David Black. And so I, I, I pitched this to him that I was going to write about this hurricane, this Galveston hurricane. Um, and he said, "Well, okay, this this is compelling, but but what's the what's the story? You know, what's the what's the narrative?" And I, for the first time, I really just started thinking in terms of, yeah, what, what is the story? What, who, who are we going to hold hands with in, in this, in this storm? How is this, besides the fact of the storm, what's what's going to drive the energy? What's going to provide the energy in, in in the book? So I started thinking about that, and I, I came back with my second proposal, which he rejected. I came back with my third proposal, my fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth proposal. He is a proposal Nazi. Came back, you know, with that last one, I was ready to quit. I was ready to find a new agent, and he knew that, and he pitched it to my publisher, and, and they loved it. But in the interim, it had become very much a, 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 a personal narrative. It became the story about you know, Texas chief weatherman Isaac Klein, who at the time was, you know, weather meteorology was sort of one of the foremost fields of, 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 of advancement in science. You know, if you were a meteorologist, you were really something. They believed they really understood everything that was you know, about weather. So there's there's the evolution of Isaac Klein. But then what I also loved was the storm as a character, just following it as it as it as it slipped off the coast of West Africa and moved across moved across the sea, gaining velocity and, and let me work in all the arcane details about hurricane physics, which I just love that stuff. And so it became this, that was the, that was the narrative. That was the, 
the conflict, the convergence of these two stories. Um, actually, very much a Lusitanian narrative. You know, Isaac Klein um, is, is, is evolving, becoming more and more of this, this star meteorologist, or thinks he is. And here's this storm coming along that's yeah. going to prove him wrong. Yeah. And so that's, yeah. So that was yeah. my first, first narrative. Yeah. And, and so that was your first narrative, and you found it was character that really was critical to it. And it was character that was critical, and it was serendipity that gave me that character. It was one of the most bizarre things. I was, yeah. I was working in the, uh, the NOAA, National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration Library, um, just outside DC, you know, just gathering hurricane details. And I happened to look down a row of, of books, and I saw this binder sticking out from a, from a shelf. I'm always like, I mean, I will look at anything in the library. I just love roaming stacks and pulling things out at random because you never know. So I pulled this thing out um, and it was, it was an old binder and sort of elongated, um, opened it up. And inside was a single newspaper clipping, single newspaper clipping written by Isaac Klein, who I knew, I, I knew at this point he, he had been the chief weatherman. I didn't know much about him at all. He was not my character yet at this point read this article and I realized, wow, this is my character, just because of that clipping. Because in that clipping, two years before the great storm, he had written that he had, he had, he had come up with this very precise, detailed technical argument for why no hurricane, no storm could ever do serious damage to Galveston, Texas. You breast. Uh, yes. I thought, wow, yeah. he didn't know. You know, he's supposed to be this great hero. He had no clue. So anyway. <laughs> Yeah, there the first. yeah, and so well, Devil in the White City. Now, how did you come across, figure, you know, see that coming? Was that? A I, didn't, I didn't see it coming. <laughs> so, like, so what happened with Devil? Yeah, what happened with Devil in the White City was, it was serendipity in a way. But, you know, as you know, I mean, if you, the, the more you put yourself in the way of luck, luck tends, tends to, to find you, I feel. Yeah. Um, so Especially I, when your antennae are up. And yes, the, yes. So I, I had set out, and actually this is actually before the Isaac Storm book um, materialized, but the, after my gun book, I had thought I, 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 I would, I wanted to do a book about a historical murder. Um, and, 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 and the thing that inspired me was a book I'd read in 1994 called The Alienist by Caleb Carr, mm -hmm. um, which, you know, it, it's fiction. It's about a serial killer in old New York. But it left me with this, this, this real sense of, of old New York, this longing for old New York. Um, and so I thought, okay, I'm going to do a book. I'm going to do a book that, um, that does the same thing. Well, it's going to be a real life nonfiction book. So I started looking. I, you know, this is the sausage being made. I took out a book from my, I was living in Seattle at the time from the University of Washington Library called The Encyclopedia of Murder. Started reading from A. You know, as one does. Yep. Um, I don't know where I came across um, uh, the killer who eventually wound up in Devil White City. Whether it was Holmes, H for Holmes, or M from Ledger, his real name. Yeah. I did I did come across him? But that's not what the, the, came across him. And I, I immediately thought, no way. I don't want to do a slasher book. I don't want to do crime porn. At the time, the thing that was really sort of also informing my thinking was the movie Gosford Park, which I have recently seen, full of character and, and, and period detail and so forth. So I kept looking, found a murder that ultimately turned out not to be terribly interesting. And it was in the course of that that I stumbled on the hurricane. Hurricane book gets done. I'm coming back again, looking for an idea. I'm high and dry. I have nothing going. I thought about doing a murder thing again. No, still, still wasn't, wasn't clicking for me. But I remembered reading about Holmes, I remembered something about the World's Fair of 1893. So I thought, I'll read about the World's Fair of 1893. Maybe there's a story in that. Started reading about the World's Fair of 1893. The first book that I, first book that I read was this excruciatingly boring monographic study of a particular building. And you know, that should have killed my interest right there. I mean, I don't know why I didn't just go out and shoot myself, but you know, it was, it was just the most boring book. But I had already learned that it's important to read the footnotes, you know, because that's where these, these, these 
poor academic historians who have to do this stuff for tenure, that's where they put good stuff. That's the juice. You mentioned the juice. So I, I go to the footnotes, and one of the first footnotes, the first footnote I read, was the trigger for the whole book. It was the fact that at the World's Fair of 1893, juicy fruit gum was introduced to consumers. It's like, I mean, I'm a big fan, always have been of juicy fruit gum. I could not believe that this gum was 100 years old. Right. And so you get that. So, yeah. I started looking through some other, other footnotes, and I saw all the people and the things that occurred at this fair. And that first day of research, I realized, wait a minute. This is the story. It's, it's the story, not just of the fair, which I didn't think anybody would read on, on its own. And it's not just the murder, which I didn't want to just dwell on the whole lot, all the stuff. It was the juxtaposition of the two. It was the story of darkness and light. And the title came to me that day, The Devil in the White City. I had to fight for the title, but, but yeah, that's, that's, how that, that's how that evolved. Yeah, yeah. Now, and now bringing it back to um, uh, the, the, the Splendid in the Vial, when you, um, you know, clearly Churchill is the central character, but your heart seems to be with Mary. Um, in many ways, <laughs> who's wouldn't? <laughs> yeah, and 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 I mean, and so I mean, what you you pull off is the intimacy within this world, you know, Holocaust going on, and um, throughout this, by the end of it, do you what's your how do you do you identify with these characters to the point that you're sad when it's over? Do you um, you know how emotionally caught up in it do you get? Um, you know, as you're in the process of writing, you know, um, for for better or worse, and I think this is this is also an aspect of of when one comes to 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 writing uh, works like this with a journalistic background, that there are there are very much um, two of me who are who are at work. There's the me that looks at things happening and, and is able to say. Wow, this is so tragic, and this is you know, sad, and terrible. And, you know, just get totally caught up in things. And there's the me, who's the journalist, and this is the, this is the the devil uh, sitting on this this shoulder, who's yeah. like, "Wow, this is great stuff. This is great stuff. People are going to cry," you know, <laughs> like that kind of thing. Not that, not that, that macabre. One thing I want to point out though is that is that when I came to this book. I did not. I did not set out to write about Winston Churchill. To do with it, I, I had moved to New York from Seattle. My, my wife, our kids had flown the coop, and as soon as we came to New York, I had this kind of epiphany about the true nature of 9/11 for New Yorkers versus the rest of us in the country. Even though we may have seen all this unfold in real time on CNN, and that was this 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 shock of this attack on your hometown. You know this. This, this dealing with, with that aspect of it and how, how, how much more vivid and wrenching the whole thing was. And it made me instantly start thinking, for whatever reason, about what we refer to um, uh, as the Blitz. Um, and I, so I started thinking, how on earth, since 9-11 since threw us for a loop and continues to this day, um, how on earth did people endure in the first phase of the Blitz, 57 consecutive nights of bombing in London, 57 consecutive nights of bombing, followed by six more months of, 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 of raids at, at, at intervals because of the, the, the weather mostly. Um, but these were intensifying raids throughout, uh, throughout the next, next six months. How do you deal with that situation? I thought at first I would just write about the typical London family, you know? find some family in the archives of the Imperial War Museum and, and try, to, try to write that story. And I thought, why not write about the quintessential London family, Winston Churchill, his family, his advisors, you know, in, 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 in this period, what turned out to be, I didn't also set out to do just the first year of his prime ministry. It's just one of those weird, weird moments of, 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 of narrative serendipity was just the fact that key elements of the story all came to an end exactly a year to the day after he became prime minister. Prime minister, May 10, 1940. May 10, 1941, the, the end of this, this very first most crucial German air campaign of the war. It comes to an end that day. 
that the also famous nutcase Rudolf has parachutes in right. Scotland. Which is one of the great elements, uh, you know, just when you think, <laughs> what's, he finally, you know, how, what is that, his eighth attempt at trying to fly over? And, and, all, and, and all the drugs he brings with him, all these on the <laughs> list, that's, that's one of my favorite things. But, but I'm also, I, I, I'm probably giving away too much stuff, but also that same day, uh, May 10, 1941, Mary's emotional and romantic situation clarifies, you know, her, her, her she, she, she decides she's not going to get married. And so, so, hey, that's why, that's a long explanation, but that's why it, it's about the first year and that's why it's about Churchill, believe me. I, there was not a day that went by over the last four and a half, whatever years, where I didn't ask myself, what am I doing? Why am I writing about church? And what right. I mean, do I think I can say that is new about this man? <laughs> Luckily, it turned out there's a lot. So, yeah. Well, I have to say, and we'll go to the questions uh, uh, soon. But you know, reading your book about uh, you know, and it's interesting that 9/11 inspired you to tell this story. And then here we are. The book comes out in February, just as a global pandemic is is raging across the world. And, um, you know, and here we are. And I have to say the effect of reading your book, um, inspired by 9-11, and where we are now, creates a very cathartic uh, uh, process in reading it. And, uh, you know, I think it's, it's, uh, thank you as, as a reader um, for, for providing no, it's, that, that it's scenario. So, it's so nice to hear, and, and you know, it is one of the bizarre things about this journey with this book. I mean, I, I, I was lucky enough to come out with the book before the pandemic. I was able to get three good solid weeks of touring the country without realizing probably putting myself at risk, you know, but three weeks of touring the country till March 12th, which also happens to be my wife's birthday, when everything skidded to a stop. And every future event that I had for the rest of the tour was canceled immediately. That's when, that's when essentially the world ended. I was fine about that, not, not about the pandemic, but you know, the first three weeks of the tour are the most important, the most grueling. And it's like, I just wanted to, to go home at that point already. But I was really um, thrilled by and relieved and touched by is that because of the pandemic, um, it did bring a lot of people to the book who, for solace. And at, at first I was like, wait, wait, what's happening here? I mean, this is a book about mass murder, chaos, death, the world going to hell, and people are coming to this for solace. That must mean things are pretty bad right now. But I came to understand as, as more and more people started telling me about that, and, and as you were just saying now, and I, and, and I get it, I get it. It's, uh, believe me, I did not plan the pandemic. I didn't time this, but you know. Oh yeah, well, I've heard some th conspiracy theories. <laughs> okay, on that note, let's go to the Q&A. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, Eric, when this is from Helen, uh, when researching the Splendid in the Vial, what was the most interesting discovery that you made? Did this change how you wrote the book? Uh, the most interesting discovery, you know, you know yeah. with, with, with a book like this, where, where, where you're dealing with somebody who has been written about or possibly more than anybody else in the world and who has written about himself more than anybody else in the world, um, it's not like there's going to be one, one revelatory moment where it's like, oh, wow, I, I didn't know any of this stuff. However, having said that, there were a lot of, of, of moments where I just thought, wow, this is, this, this is fascinating. I mean, like, for example, when there's, a, there's an episode where, where Churchill orders an attack on the French fleet because he, he doesn't want the French fleet to fall into the hands of, of the Germans incredibly wrenching moment about which I, I had known nothing about that particular incident. You know, the initial, you know, first few minutes of the attack, you know, the, the, the British you know, squadron set out to, to do this attack, Force H, blows up uh, one of the one of the most important uh, capital ships of the French Navy, the Britannia, with a loss of 1,200 lives, young sailors, you know, just in that instant. This is Winston Churchill firing on a, a, a former and, and, and potentially still ally. So that was an amazing moment. But the best thing I think for the whole, the whole story, and, and, and again, there were so many little things that came up that I, I kept, I, I found myself saying, this has definitely got to be in the book. This has got to be, this is going to be. But my favorite thing was, was Mary Churchill. Yeah. 
Um, Mary Churchill, I didn't expect her to, to, to be in the book, let alone to have as big a role as, as, as she, she played. I discovered that she had a diary in the Churchill Archive Center at Cambridge. Um, it was restricted, however, it was not accessible um, by, by, by scholars. Um, uh, that was planned to be for someday in the future. But I was invited to ask um, uh, Mary Churchill's daughter um, uh, for permission to, to look at the diary. I asked, you know, you never know. If you don't ask, the answer is always no. It's one of my, my firm maxims. Didn't hear from her, didn't hear from her. And finally she said, yeah, sure. Yeah, you, you, can, you can read it. And the reason is she, she loved my treatment of Churchill in, 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 in my book, Dead Wake, about the Lusitania. So, you know, right. cast your seat on the water, whatever. So, so I, I, I read this diary and, and I just fell, kind of fell in love with Mary Churchill. I just wonderfully articulate young woman who was just in love with her dad in, in, in all the right ways, not in the Trumpian way, you know, in love with her dad, you know, and just, just saw the great perspective of the war and, and, and just, just everything, just, just huge perspective. But also she was after all, you know, 17 at the start of the book, 18 in the, you know, in, in, in the second year, when the second year began, um, she was a, a, a young woman who, who, like to have fun, you know, and, and it's dancing and, and that's what, that's really cut to the core of what I was trying to write about was how did people get through it? Well, well it's amazing how, how much regular life goes on mm -hmm. um, throughout this whole book. You know, you just, how much, yeah, I mean, it, it, you know, how do you get through, well, you have fun when and where you can. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, she had a lot of fun. She, she refers periodically to sessions of snogging in the hayloft with RAF pilots, you know, so, hey. Okay, listen, let's, let's, this is from Molly. Hello, I'm a big fan of John Wynette, the former New Hampshire governor and ambassador to England after Kennedy. Wynette was so very, very different in style from Winston Churchill, but both men were very effective leaders. Can Mr. Larson discuss Wynette's relationship with Churchill? Yeah, yeah. So, 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 and why not um, uh, replace uh, Joseph Kennedy, who was who was uh, who was uh, reviled actually um, in 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 the British government uh, hierarchy. Um, he was also considered to be a, 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 a gross coward. Um, one of Churchill's ministers said, um, he said, but he's something to the effect. I, I'm paraphrasing this man. He said, "I thought my daffodils were yellow until I met <laughs> Joseph Kennedy." <laughs> so, he was not. He was not well liked. He was very skeptical about Britain's uh, chances in, in in the war. That comes from it, and 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 he was um, he was sort of a a, a a dour guy, but he all content, um, very very solid, very very compelling guy, who had faith in Churchill, and Churchill had 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 faith in him, and that really helped shape um, uh, Churchill's courtship of Roosevelt um, for the for the for the essentially the next year, of course, until Pearl Harbor decided things um, for, you know, in terms of America's entry into the war. Okay, here we go. Kathleen wants to know, I have read several, several of your books and enjoyed them all. Which was your favorite to write and why? You know, people have asked me that question and I, 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 I always sidestep it with the same answer. I don't have a favorite. It's like asking me who, which of my kids is, is my favorite kid. Each book, exactly the answer I give. <laughs> so you know, you know what I mean. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna let it, let it sit at that. Okay, I'm with you, man. Just had to throw it at you to see how you'd respond. Um, okay, I'm going to a short, sweet one. When and how do you know when to end your story? That's from Malcolm. Oh man, Malcolm! You know it's 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 a tough thing. It's case case by case. Um, I, I will say that that when I start out um, uh, doing a doing a book that, with, with narrative, not with nonfiction, um, you do, or at least I do. I do what's referred to as a, you know, a book proposal, like I was talking about with with Isaac Storm and so forth. How long um, is the book? How long is your one of your typical proposals? They're they're typically about. 
60 to 90 pages. They have an, an opening essay, opening chapter, opening essay, you know, essay about how I plan to pursue, what the story is, what the parameters of the story, what the arc is, um, uh, how I plan to pursue it, what's new and so forth. And then a capsule outline of the entire book based on what I know so far. The capsule outline being essentially an educated guess. You know, each, each chapter being anywhere from one paragraph to six paragraphs. Um, but in the course of that, um, I, I, with, with all the proposals that, that I've done thus far, I, I, I always know, um, um, uh, at least broadly, where and when and how the story is going to end. Um, yeah. I'm, a, I'm a big believer in not setting out until you know where the ending is, what the ending is. Mm -hmm. Right. And you get better control of your material as a result. And, and, also, and, also, and also because, you know, it, it, it's, <laughs> it's so much easier to get somewhere when you know where you're going. You know what I mean? Oh, so. yeah. 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 No. And you, okay. From Catherine, how do you learn about, how did you learn about the mass observation project? Oh. How much of it did you plow, whoa, where did it go? Uh, plow through and how did you decide what to, to use? All right, yeah, so mass observation was, was one of the sort of things that I, 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 I yeah, this is why, this is why, this is what sets me apart from, you know, people who are, you know, total Churchill scholars is because, you know, everybody knows about this thing except me, you know. Um, I started doing the research on the book and I came across this, this outfit called mass observation. Mass observation was a social sciences organization <clears throat> created well before the war with the very pedestrian goal, if you will, of, of trying, to, trying to come to a, 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 build a good sense of what ordinary British life was like, and really ordinary, like quotidian. Yeah, um, yeah. They recruited hundreds of diarists to write about their daily lives. The test that they were advised to use before they signed up is describe everything on your mantelpiece. You know, it's that kind of a thing. So these people started keeping all these diaries before the war. War comes along, and, and many of them still kept their diaries, thank goodness. And these provide such an incredible fine-grained sense of how people coped, how people got through the war. Um, you know, one of my favorites, yeah, I, I, could, have, I could have read these diaries, you know, for, for, forever. Um, happily, um, six, there, there were six compilations of, of elements from this diary produced by mass observation by, their, their, by its director, Tom Harrison, back, back in, the, in the war period. Um, and and, and these, are, these are a tremendous resource. Slog through these, as, 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 as the questioner said, yes, but it became very apparent to me um, what would be of value, um, of most value. I, I, instead of having a whole bunch of different diaries, I do quote many, I really wanted to have one stellar character to sort of, again, somebody we can hold our hands with. And that was this woman, Olivia Cockett. Olivia Cockett was a, uh, a single uh, young woman who was having an affair with a married man. She was a clerk with Scotland Yard and and she, she was a really eloquent writer, very, very detailed, very rich. She, she could have written novels at some point. So, so her story, um, it really struck me, was kind of the story of, of uh, you know, again, how, how, people, how people cope, what happened in that, that, that first year. She begins, like so many others, terrified. You know, the first deliberate bombing of, of London was September 7th, 1940, terrifying. Terrifying, terrifying, terrifying. And it continued, of course, for 57 consecutive nights. Wow. Her terror grows, her terror grows. Until one night, um, uh, uh, when, when the Luftwaffe attack, they typically drop incendiary bombs first to set things on fire um, so that um, you know, these, these, these great fires would be a guide to the bombers that were following because navigation was still a pretty iffy thing. And, and visual navigation guided by a fire was the best thing. Um, so one of the incendiary bombs falls just outside her family home in London. She goes out, she puts this incendiary bomb out, as, as people were advised to try to do. She puts this bomb out, and she is thrilled with herself. She is so thrilled. At last, she is no longer this passive victim. Yeah. And, and she becomes more and more courageous after that, um, uh, to the point where one night she's, she's walking with Bill, her lover, who 
paradoxically, uh, not paradoxically, but just happens to ha actually be, have become more and more cowardly, much to her irritation. They're walking along, uh, a raid begins, they hear two bombs falling, the Germans had equipped the bombs with these, 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 these audio devices that made them sort of scream as they fell. And they're walking along, so Bill, Bill shouts, to, shouts to Olivia, says, get down, get down, and Olivia's reaction is, not in my new coat, I'm not. <laughs> yeah. And that was the story of London. Yeah, you know, right. May 10th and May 10th. Okay, let's see. I think see. we have time for about one more. Okay, one more. They got a good one, Nat. Okay, let's see here. Oh, uh, well, okay. <laughs> okay, hang on. Which, okay, this is from Kendall. Which books have changed you and your perspective most profoundly? Oh, yeah, yeah. Which books have changed me and my career perspective? You know, what I think, the, the way I would answer that, I would have to say my book, In the Garden of Beasts, um, about the America's first ambassador to Nazi Germany um, during Hitler's rise, it, it it made me realize something very profound and something I think everybody, this is a nice way to end this, I think, something everybody really needs to pay a lot of attention to, I feel now especially. It made me realize in a very clear way how fast things change, how fast things can change, things that you never thought could possibly happen, but suddenly, suddenly it happens. And that, that has left me positively chilled. Yes, it should lead all, all of us chilled. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you, Eric. Thank you, Nat. This is fun. Thank you. Thank you, Audrey. You know, yeah, of course. There, I'm really sorry to everyone at home who asked questions. There are 60 waiting. We would need many, many more hours. But there is one question I've seen repeated quite a lot in the questions, and I'll ask that quickly. What was the soundtrack you listened to to write The Splendid and the Vile? Okay, the Splendid and the Vile. Um, I, it was a melange of things, but the key, the key element was um, the key element was uh, was the English patient. Really? Oh, yeah. I love yeah. that. And, and, so, and some very moody, there's some great cello stuff out there, really moody stuff. Uh, what's her name? Zoe Keating? Zoe Keating? Anyway, great stuff. So you got to do a spoken word al album? <laughs> Am I going to do a spoken word album? No. Yeah. Yeah. No, okay. No. <laughs> Maybe one day, we can hope. Okay. And Yes. Well, I just want to say thank you, Nat and Eric, again for your time. This is the sort of conversation I dream about. So thank you both. Thank and you. thank you for all turning Andrew. in and watching from home. Thanks for showing up for authors, publishers, indie book selling, and our incredible staff here at Harvard Bookstore. If you'd like to support Eric and the bookstore, the, click on the link that is in the chat. You can purchase the book there. We sincerely appreciate your support now and always. Gentlemen, have a wonderful night. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night.